Let's open in our Bibles right to the middle, the book of Psalms, and find the 92nd one. I'd like to talk with you from God's Word and ask and answer the question, who or what is controlling your life? I want you to think about that with me. Who is controlling your time? Who dictates what you do with your time? Who dictates your attitude? What or who is controlling your attitude? How about your actions? Who or what is compelling you and directing you in what you do with your body? How about your time? What's dominating your time? Who is dominating your time? Who attracts and draws and like a magnet just pulls you and causes you to invest time? And how about your treasures? What, what can't you stop doing with the treasures you have on earth? Your, the stewardship of your treasures, your finances, your money, the possessions you have. Who or what controls those? The 92nd Psalm gives a description of what someone looks like that God controls all those things. That God controls their attitude and their actions. That God controls their treasures and their time. And that control speaks of them being planted, being affixed and being surrounded by the things of God. And we're right in the midst of a study of looking at who or what is determining everything about your future, and that is the one who controls you. Whoever or whatever controls you and me is the one that is dictating our future. And you and I will become looking like more and more whoever or whatever controls us. The longer we live, the dominant control in our life dictates what we look like and act like and respond like and invest in. And most often we don't realize that it is ourself that's calling the shots as believers instead of God. And that's why we come up short when difficult situations come. We don't respond to those situations the way we thought we should have if God was in control. And then in those disastrous times we find out that we are not truly allowing us and our spirits and our time and our attitudes and our lives to be governed by his spirit. Because if we walk in the spirit, he controls us. Who is going to control your life, you or God? Who is going to take up your time, you or the Lord? Who is going to dominate the attention of your mind, your agenda or God's? Now, what is God's agenda? I'm holding it this morning. This is God's agenda. If you're a business person and you go into a meeting, and especially if it's an important meeting, you always say, what's the agenda? And usually you want to know it ahead of time so you can think about it. God's given it to us ahead of time so we can think about it. This book is God's agenda, and he wants to write it on our hearts and on our minds. And God's word wants to be the agenda of our life. God wants to control you and me. He wants to be in total control. Now, he was at the beginning. When we were born again, God was totally in control. He is the one. He is the initiator. He is the sovereign, supernatural giver and imparter of life. But as you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in him. It becomes a choice. He supernaturally bore us from darkness to life, from the power of Satan to God. We received a new spirit and a new heart. And then he gives us the opportunity to yield to him. How is he doing at getting more and more control of your life and of my life is what he asked. He gave us his gracious power by his spirit. He empowered to us his very life for eternity. He made us live and walk in hope. He said, I am your savior, your shepherd, and your guide. But I want you to choose to yield the control of your daily life, your daily choices, your responses and your attitudes, the direction of the actions of your life. I want you to give those back to me and allow me to control you. When God controls my time, he bears fruit from the way I spend it. You see, that's the test. Fruit bearing is a test of who's controlling your life. Little fruit, little control. Much fruit, much control by God. 
When he controls my treasures, he brings an increase for him that's eternal from temporary things that are passing away. I got a, a precious note this week, uh, sent out a message on, on stewardship, and someone came right back. They must have been at work, shot me a note right back and said, this really impacted me. My my jobs benefit uh, the the uh, uh, stock option or some I don't know what they were talking about but some kind of uh, investment vehicle that their company gives them lost a vast amount of its worth this week and they said it was a good reminder that when God controls my treasures that whatever happens is an increase that counts for eternity and a reminder that we're just stewards, we're not possessors. When God controls my attitudes, he gets the glory as I bear the fruit of the Spirit in the soil of my heart attitudes. And when God controls my action, he gets to live through me. He gets the glory. I bear the fruit that pleases him. And I receive rewards from his hand. See, the, the control factor of our lives is the determinative factor that brings fruit that lasts forever. Well, we often want control, and the battle that rages each day, each hour, each moment is all about who or what is going to control me. And when we're in control, we use an operating system that's called lust. Oh, you say, that's not me, not lust? No, no, I'm not one of those wicked, wicked types. Lust is anything that we have a great and intense desire for. You can have a lust for recreation. You can have a lust for sports. You can have a lust for beautiful things. I always remember a friend I went to school with, the insightful comment his mother made. They, she owned, her family owned a whole series of home, before there were Home Depots, similar types of things, a whole chain of them all across the, the city of Philadelphia. They were a very wealthy, blue blood, old line, rich American family, and they owned these huge uh, Home Depot things. And so when the mother retired in Palm Beach, she said, my big need in life was, where was I going to put all of these as she downsized? My beautiful ancient Chinese vases from the Ming and Ying and Wing and Ling whatever dynasty, you know. And she says, once I, I got the vase, then I had to have a beautiful piece of furniture to put the vase on. And then she says, I had to find a beautiful mirror and, a, and then paintings to put on both sides. And she says, I realized that I was being controlled by my possessions. Because after you get the Ming vase and the, the ancient 14th century piece to put under it and then the paintings on the right, you got to hire a security firm to guard it all. And it was so interesting that the son left the family fortune and went to pastor a tiny church of 70 people out in the sticks of North Carolina. And wanted to learn to serve the Lord without the allurement of that wealth. You see, it's so hard because we want to control our lives and we think we know what's best. And God says, if you control with your operating system, lust is never satisfied. You always want just a little bit more. And lust is when our flesh calls the shots. Our appetites, our hunger, our desire for security. Do you know America is obsessed with security, obsessed with convenience, obsessed with comfort? I mean, how many times have you been driving down the street and if you can't find a, a parking space right next to where you want to go, you won't go there? That's an indicator of our society. Comfort and convenience dictate. And that gets into our spiritual lives. And I'll tell you what, being a Christian is not comfortable nor convenient. Nor is it very secure in a worldly sense. It is an eternal sense, but not in a day-to-day way, the way he wants us to live. Well, all of life is about control. The flesh lusts against the spirit. It's war that wages day in and day and uh, night. And you are determining who's winning today by the little choices. Either we feed and strengthen the hold of the spirit in our life or we feed and strengthen the hold of the flesh in our life. So either we're growing in the flesh or in God. We're either growing in lust with the flesh controlling us or in the spirit, God controlling us. And what we want to ask is, who's got the upper hand? Who's really controlling you and me? We can look at God's word and see what a person controlled by God looks like. And we can look in God's word and see what a person controlled by the flesh looks like. And then we can just say, I'm either like this or like this. And that's why he gave us his word.
Jesus wants to control more and more of my life. That allows him to produce his life in me. The life of Jesus lived out in me is called fruit. It's called him controlling me and causing the outflow of my life to please him. And he wants more and more control. And he wants to farm more and more of the soil of my life so he can increase that soil into fruit bearing every season of my life. A farmer, well, it's complicated nowadays because the government actually pays people not to raise stuff. The farm subsidies just kind of messes up the illustration. But in the real world, outside of government subsidies, a farmer tries to keep the maximum output of his fields. So they rotate them and they allow different crops to grow, some which use nitrogen and some which replace nitrogen. And and the whole process is to maximize. And they're always trying to clear their fields and to make sure that, that everything is maximized. That's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to clear the fields. He wants to rotate the crops. He wants to maximize the usefulness of my life where he has placed me to glorify him more and more and more. That means that getting older should be something you look forward to. It's kind of like people love getting tenured or they love getting vested, fully vested. It's because they're anticipating more and more and more return. You know what God says? The older you get, the more fruitful you are for me. That's what Psalm 92 is all about. I'd like to read it again to you. Okay, starting in verse 12. And with hearts open, let's listen to God describing what someone he's controlling their life looks like. That's what verse 12 onward is all about. When God's running my life, when he's calling the shots, when he's in the driver's seat, this is what I'm like. Starting in verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. I mean, my life is flourishing We're growing like a cedar in Lebanon. That means that the storms only make us tougher. The storms only make us more fruitful. It makes us more resilient. It makes us more glorious to God. All the troubles that we go through in life, they don't destroy us, they strengthen us. Verse 13, those who are planted in the house of the Lord, that means they want to worship him. When God's controlling, everything to me is worship. I can't compartmentalize my life. If there's any place I can't worship God, I don't want to be there. Because I want to be planted in the courts of God. Now, we don't have a a physical location we have to go to. This is not the temple of God. You are. You have a portable temple. Your body is God's temple. So anywhere it is, you can worship. And anywhere you go, you can't worship. You shouldn't be there. See, that's what he's talking about, this planted. Wherever we are, we feel like we're in the very house of God. We, verse 13, flourish in the courts of our God. We want to be acknowledging his presence. And anything I do, or anything I say, or anywhere I go, or or any environment I'm in, that makes me not feel God's presence. Now, if we know that God does not like bloodshed, And God does not like the occult. And God does not like anything to do with with necromancy, with, with anything to do with spiritism, with demons. Why would a Christian ever go to a place that looks like a cemetery and has dead bodies that are supposed to scare them as they, or creatures or hideous creatures, all of which is associated with the occult. Do you think that you feel God's presence more there? No. Reformation Day, that's the day that, that we should think of Martin Luther and the theses. It's become the day that, that we openly follow pagan rituals. Halloween is not of God. And it doesn't please God. And dressing up like a mythical creature or an occultic creature or any other creature does not please God. It doesn't help us, as it says here, flourish in the courts of God, feeling his presence and committing to worship and serving him. Verse 14, they shall still bear fruit in old age. That means fruit isn't tied to my physical condition. They shall be fresh and flourishing. My spiritual uh, vigor is not tied to my physical vigor. It's, It's a byproduct of the more control God has of me. So the older I get, the more overflowing my life should be. It should be that the older you get, when people come in contact with you, they sense 
that they've been around the Lord because you have grown so much to be like him. Can you think of people like that in your life? I have always followed and learned from older people. And the problem I'm getting is now I'm getting old and all the older people are gone that I used to follow. Those people that, that love the Lord, that could never get enough of him, that always like a pine tree, the sap of the Spirit of God just flowed out of their life. And when you left them, you were still, it was stuck to you. You just felt what they loved about the Lord sticking to your life. That's how the Bible describes us. When God's in control, and verse 15, when God's in control, my life is declaring the Lord is upright. That, that he doesn't change. He's a sure uh, guide and, and friend and, and keeper. And he is my rock. He's safe. He's, he'll hold me through the storms and I, I won't, won't ever lose my way. And there's no unrighteousness in him. He's good. See, when God's controlling my life, this is what I'm like. This is a description of one that God's controlling. Let's bow before him. Father, I pray that we would want you to be in control of our life. And when you are, then Lord, this life of ours is growing in good, clean soil. And this life of ours is an internal expression on the outside of what's going on on the inside. There's no hypocrisy there. That we are growing from the inside out. That, that we have internalized your truth. That our hearts are yours. And the rest of us is, is getting in step. But you own and control our hearts. And then we don't get off on things that don't please you. You have to trim. And then, Lord, all of our life is, is held up to you. All of our fruit is at the top, held up for your inspection. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would learn how to let you control our lives more today. And not just hear it, but do it and yield to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I was talking about this message to my wife, you know, Bonnie is so sweet. She said, I said, well, what should I title the sermon this week? She said, caught in a tree. She said, it's the third week you're talking about the palm tree. I thought, caught in a tree. Is that a way to title my sermon? Isn't it good to have an honest wife? So I'm going to get us out of the tree. We're in the palm tree. If you remember palm trees, I'm talking about the righteous, verse 12, uh, will flourish like a palm tree. God picked something that, that's still around for us to use as a metaphor. And he says, if you're righteous, if I'm controlling your life, you'll flourish like a palm tree. How does a palm tree flourish? Number one, when we started getting caught in the tree, we saw that a palm tree only grows in good, clean soil. And you and I, that remember Psalm 101, I took you through that in, in, in depth, that a righteous person knows that the, the fruit of their life comes from being planted in good, clean soil. That's a choice we make, that what we're going to feed our souls and our minds and our lives on, our emotions, what we're going to feed ourselves with has to be good, clean soil. Secondly, we saw last time that a righteous person grows from the inside out. God desires truth in the inward parts. And I took you through all of those verses. It says God is watching to see if we're tuned into him or not. He wants to, to control us, to call the shots. That's what God wants in our life. His truth within us, Psalm 51, 6. Our words and deeds flowing from what we really are, Matthew 12, 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Now the third truth. God says, if you are controlled by me, then you are going to be, in this sense, like a palm tree. A palm tree, thirdly, not only grows in good soil, not only does it grow from the inside out, but a palm tree doesn't get sidetracked. It has no branches. It doesn't expend its energy going in every possible direction. If you think of a palm tree, you always think of that, of that stick curving graciously up, and then you see at the top, you know, the fronds and the coconuts or the dates, whatever kind of palm tree it is. God says a characteristic of palm trees is that they don't have countless branches. Now, spiritually, what can that mean? Well, let me show you a few verses. Look at Deuteronomy. You're in Right here in the middle, go back to the left, to the front, to the fifth book, Deuteronomy. And we're going to go from Deuteronomy all the way across uh, to the New Testament. But Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. And I want you to, to learn about the palm tree that grows no branches. To be sure, a palm tree has fronds at the top, but no branches. In other words, it spends no time on side issues. The eye single is a rare item, but it's found among the Lord's people. But what does it look like? Deuteronomy 4, verse 29. 
For up from there you will seek the Lord your God, Moses says, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, did you catch what the Lord expects from us? I'm not saying what we all are all the time. I'm not saying what any of us are most of the time. But it doesn't change what God expects from us. He says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. See, that's why it's so important right here. If you want to get something from the Lord, then you have to give him something. You have to give him your undivided heart. That means you can't be here saying, yeah, what you're saying is true, Lord, but I don't want to give this up. What you're saying is true, but I don't want to. Then you can't find him, as it were, this morning until you seek with all your heart. Why? Because God wants our complete focus in order for him to act on our behalf. Now keep going to 2 Chronicles. You're in Deuteronomy, and then it goes Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 2 Samuel, 1 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. Now there is a often neglected part of the Bible, Second Chronicles. It's kind of a boring record of this king, this king, this king, this king, and lived so many years and did this and that. But look at Second Chronicles 16.9. In the middle of an indictment, God is actually indicting one of the kings who has been unfaithful to him. It's King Asa. And, and King Asa didn't fully follow and obey the Lord. But look what he says in verse 9. Second Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of one whose heart is loyal to him. Here's the indictment. In these things you've done foolishly, therefore now you shall have wars. What he said is your heart is not completely toward me. But don't get wrapped up in the negative part. Look at the the affirmation that God makes. It says, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong that his God wants to be on your team. Do you remember when you were little and used to pick teams, uh, play baseball or whatever, and everyone would line up and you'd get two captains and then the captains would get to pick one at a time, you know, back and forth. And what did you always pick first? The best. I mean, there were always, when we used to play, there were always these guys that we knew they could hit them right over the fence and we would win. And so we would pick them first. Well, look what this verse says. It says, out there, uh, standing in that row, the Lord is out there. And he said, if you want me on your team, look what it says. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong. I will, I will be on your team with everything you do in life on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Whose heart, as it says in the, in the scriptures, whose heart is undivided and completely his. When I, I remember first memorizing this verse, uh, reminded me of, that was in the early days of uh, satellite dishes and microwave dishes and uh, how precisely you had to have those things uh, situated to get the signal. And I remember as I was walking around memorizing this verse at night, I had it on a card and I was walking around back campus and mumbling it out loud and all of a sudden I stopped and it was at night and I looked up at the stars and I thought, you're actually looking down tonight, aren't you? That's one of the byproducts of scripture memorization and meditation. The more you talk about it, you start interacting with it and you realize that God is actually fulfilling his word. And I said, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for one whose heart is completely toward him. And I'll, I'll never forget, I know exactly where I was standing. Uh, it was 240 acres. And I was standing and I stopped and I looked up and I said, you're looking right now, aren't you? I mean, out loud. That's one of the benefits of memorizing outdoors. When no one sees you, it's okay to talk to yourself or to the Lord out loud. And I just stopped and I said, your eyes are looking to and fro right now, aren't you? And I remember right there, I just said, then here's a heart that's completely for you. I want all of you that it's possible to live out in my life. I want to completely allow you to control me. Now, The next day, we have to restate that because our flesh is always warring to take it back. But I'll never forget my 2 Chronicles 16, 9 when I realized that God wants to see if we're tuned in to him or not. 
And if we are, then what we say is, I'm going to limit things that distract me. I'm going to limit going places that make my heart cold. I'm going to limit reading things that, that cause me to have confusion. That's a flowing together. When you, when you allow into your life things that are opposed to God, it brings confusion. God says, I'm not the author of confusion. I want you to tune completely into me. And what that means is when we're tuned completely into him, we stop going off into side issues, as Asa was doing when God condemned him in this verse. Let's look at another one, Psalm 73. Now back to familiar territory. Go right to the middle and find the book of Psalms and look at David's testimony, Psalm 73 and verse 25. Because David said that he had chosen as his top priority on earth the Lord. He said, my top priority... I just spoke a couple weeks ago at a a school in Michigan, and as I was speaking to those going into the ministry, I said, if someone comes up to you and says, what are you going to do with your life? You don't have to tell them, because most don't know if they're going to pastor, if they're going to be an associate or assistant or a missionary or in rescue mission work or whatever. I said, tell them this, I know I'm going to serve the Lord my whole life. Did you catch that? You don't have to say, I'm going to do this or that. I just know one thing. I want to serve the Lord. He's my top priority. Where did I get that from? Psalm 73, 25. David said, my top priority on earth for you is is to serve you, Lord. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire, Psalm 73, verse 25, besides you. He says, you are the focus of my life. Have you ever made that choice? Have you ever said, Lord, as your eyes run to and fro, I want you with all my heart? You can renew that. The devil wants to say, ah, you've blown it too many times. No, God can't use you. No, don't say that again, you'll fail. And God says, no, I'm looking for someone whose heart is tuned into me. And I will be on their team and I will show myself strong And David said, David, David, David the murderer, David the adulterer, David who had the wildest kids, kids who were raping other family members, kids who were murdering other brothers and sisters, David, yeah, David. David said, there's none on earth I desire besides you. And God says, you're a man after my own heart. In spite of your sin, I see your heart. I see that you totally want me. And God responds to that. Here's another one if you want to turn to the New Testament now to Matthew 6. So keep going to the right, Matthew 6. Look what Jesus said about this idea, this notion, this, this desire God has for us. Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23. If a palm tree grows no grant branches, that's to remind us that God wants completely Uh, our focus so he can act on our behalf. God wants to see if we're tuned in to him. God wants to see if we're his, our top priority is him. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 22. If we stay focused on him, he will flood our lives. Uh, Flood us full of the power of his light in our life. The lamp of the body is the eye, Jesus said. If, therefore, your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, therefore, the light that is in you is darkness, how great that darkness is. What he said is that that he wants our eye to be single upon him, and, and we'll see that more in just a moment. But the idea is that God says, if you will get your eye... The, the entrance gate of your life, if you will get it on me, I am the source of light. I will flood. I will fill you with light. You know, people always are saying, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what to do with my family. I don't know with my job. I don't know what to do with my finances and future. And, and their eyes are on everything. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting advice from everyone but God. And that's why they don't know what to do. You see, the righteous are as bold as a lion. But the wicked run when no one's chasing them. Why is that? Because when we know the Lord, there there is this flood in our life of, of spiritual assurance of what we're living for and what we're doing. Well, look at the next verse, verse 24. 
Jesus says this, Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus says either I control you or you control yourself, and you can only have one master. So who's controlling you? Me, or are you doing it? And if you do it, it'll dissipate into your flesh, it'll dissipate into everything around you, because you cannot control yourself and do a good job. Only I, your creator, can do that. And what does it start with? If your eye be single, if your eye be focused on me, if your eyes look unto Jesus, the author and the one who will finish your salvation, as the writer of Hebrews says, chapter 12, 1 and 2. So, Jesus says, either I control you or you control yourself. And I want to control you, the Lord says. Who is running your time? If you constantly, perpetually say, I just can't find time to memorize, I can't find time to pray, I can't find, find time to read the word, I can't find time to witness, is God controlling your time or are you? If you say, I'm always finding, or, or actually people say, I lose my temper, but if you're always finding it, I would that all of us lost our tempers, but, but we find them all the time. And if you're always finding your temper and finding your selfishness and finding your impatience, who's running your attitudes, you or the Lord? If you're perpetually out of money and in financial duress and everything else, is God controlling your finance? Does God ever run money that way? Never. So you're controlling your attitude. You're controlling your time. You're controlling your money. If your body is always calling the shots and if you're totally out of control and, and, and your body is just, just dragging you everywhere it shouldn't, is God controlling that body? No. He says if you control it, you'll have the fruit of the flesh. If I control it, you have the fruit of the Spirit. I want to control it. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 13. Keep going to the right. About this idea of having no branches to be like a palm tree. Jesus compares it to him controlling us and flooding us with life. But in Philippians 3 and verse 13, Paul says, I limit my choices in life in order to please God. See, he had mind over appetite, mind over desires, mind over body. And that mind over body was energized by the Holy Spirit. And this is Paul's testimony, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching toward those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I am limiting anything that keeps me from running in my lane and crossing the finish line. What does that mean? Paul says, I'm limiting my choices in life because I want to please God. What happens when we don't do that? Last verse, James 1 and verse 8. Okay, oh, is this, this is a good verse. James was the first New Testament epistle written by the brother of Jesus, his earthly brother, James, who's mentioned in the scriptures. Jesus had four brothers. Two of them wrote books of the New Testament, James and Jude. This is not James the Apostle James from the Twelve. This is James the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. This is Jesus' brother James that didn't believe in Christ till after the resurrection. He's pastoring the first church. He's pastoring this, this overflow from the day of Pentecost and the succeeding uh, great events. And he's pastoring a group of people that needed some pastoring. And look what, what he says to them in verse 8. A double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. James 1, 8. What is he saying? James reminds us that a wavering between God's control or my control destabilizes my life. It makes me unstable everywhere. You meet a believer who's unstable in their lives. I mean, they're fluctuating all over in their family and in their marriage and in their job and in their personal life and in their... You know what they are? They're double-minded. Somewhere out there, they have something that they're controlling and are refusing to give up to God, and God is over here trying to control their life, and they are fighting him over there. And if you're double-minded, if you're not saying, I want you to control all of my life, that instability spreads into every part of your life. Think about it. Anything that's out of control in your life is not under God's control. Whatever, attitude, action, time, your, your uh, treasures, anything that's out of control. 
isn't under God's control. And he says, I want to control it. So the, the scriptures tell us that if we want to flourish for God, we yield the control of our life to him. Well, let me take you to another passage. Palm trees, four facets, spiritually true about them. Grow in clean soil. They grow from the inside out. They have no branches. And here's the last thing. A palm tree, by its very botanical architecture, has all of its product of of that palm tree held aloft at the very top. In fact, if you ever go over there, date palms have to be, in the old days, they had to be climbed by these, these workers that were able to go right up the, they just would hold and climb right up the, the palm tree, and they still do that to get coconuts and everything else. Because you always have to go to the top of the tree to get the fruit. Now, there's something about that holding the product of the life up high that has a spiritual application. A palm tree is characterized by having all of its fruit on top. In other words, it's offering on a daily basis everything it has upward. Now, how could we apply that to a Christian? Well, the way to live the Christian life is this. To start out the day, that's why it's nice. You might not be a morning person, but you should start your day with the Lord. Maybe it's brief, and you're a night person, and you do your heavy-duty Bible study at night. And we're all different. The Bible never mandates when you do your intense feeding. But you must orient yourself to the Lord every day. You have to start the day with Him. Again, you might be hardly able to open your eyes and and you're one of these feelers, you're not a springer and you're just barely able. But you know what? While you're feeling around, you ought to just drop to your knees uh, unless you're prone to fall asleep, then stand up, you know. And and just orient yourself to the Lord and just say, with my whole heart I want to seek you. I present myself a living sacrifice, whatever. See, it's the idea of holding my life up to the Lord for his inspection. So what I see at the beginning of the day is, Lord, I have, you know, 24 hours, or this week I have 168 hours, or, uh, you know, today I'm going to be awake for the next 12, 14, 16 hours. I offer that to you. I want to live. I want to maximize. Yes, I have to go to work. Yes, I have to take the trash out. Yes, I have to mow the lawn. Yes, I have to, you know, take care and and earn money and and please my employer. But I want to maximize today for you. That's the idea of all the fruit at the top. All of the product of this tree is offered. This is the ambition of the righteous. Life is measured on a daily basis for God. It's measured by a new standard. Life is reduced to either being lived for what is good or what is not good. What survives the fires of the judgment seat of Christ or what that doesn't. And so I want to say, Lord, how much of today can I offer to you that will please you? Lead me, strengthen me, guide me to do that. That's the idea of the palm tree. The key is, what does God want me to do? Not what do I want to do. You know, George Mueller, the great spiritual giant, you know what he said the hardest thing to do in his life was? Get his fingers off the scales of knowing that God's will. He was always tipping it in favor of what he was interested in. And he says, I want to be off, and I want it to be what God is interested in. So the Lord wants us to hold everything we have before him and to ask for his examination of that and approval. Our friends, our goals, our long-term strategy, our our job, our entertainment, our recreation, our hobbies, uh, our secret parts of our life, everything we hold up for his scrutiny and say, what do you think of that? What's your agenda for that in my life? When we do that, what do we look like? Well, back to Psalm 92. Look at this. The righteous flourish like a palm tree. Verse 12, they grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Verse 13, they're planted in the house of the Lord and they flourish in the courts of God. They're bearing fruit. What does a life look like that everything is held out to God? Number one, that life is lived intentionally bearing fruit in every season, increasing to the end. What this is calling us to, listen, the Psalm 92 life teaches us how useless self-pity is. 
You know what self-pity does when we say, oh, you know, I, I wish that this hadn't happened. It just paralyzes us. People, people, you're supposed to be, and I'm supposed to be looking at this as I'm offering my life to the Lord. I'm not pitying myself for what I don't have that someone else has or what I do have, some limitation that someone else does. A Psalm 92 life that's focused on the Lord realizes how useless self-pity is, how dangerous selfishness becomes. Do you realize everything we're selfish about, we lose. Whatever we hold on to and clutch tightly, God says you lose. But whatever you give, you keep forever. Doesn't mean give up. Doesn't mean put it on the corner for the trash truck to get. It means surrendering the control of, giving it up. It's kind of like we're at a closing. And, and we are, instead of negotiating and say, Lord, you can have this but not that. You can't have this, but you can have that. You ever had someone buying your house and they want to buy stuff in it? You go, oh, no, I want all that stuff. God says, I want all your stuff. And you say, you can have it. It's yours. So that's what a Psalm 92 life is like. A Psalm 92 life lived intentionally for the Lord learns how worthless greed ends up. Greed me wanting for myself, ends up that that stuff burns. Everything that you hold for yourself greedily burns in the end. In fact, I was telling my students uh, in Michigan, their Michigan touches on Canada, I said, what would you think if you found out that, that all of a sudden everything in Canada was 10 cents on the dollar? In other words, our dollar eighty six gas costs 18.6 cents up there. Uh, in other words, you know, a, a $10 steak costs a dollar up there. And for these younger people, I said, in a $30,000 car costs 3000 I said, would you go to Canada? Oh, man, they said, we'd go right now. We'd leave class. I said, one catch. You can't bring anything back from Canada that you buy up there. They said, we wouldn't buy anything because we don't want to live in Canada. We want to live here in Michigan. And I said, that's what's going on in life. Stuff is cheap down here. We can have a lot of fun with very little, very little expense of spiritual energy. Things cost a lot in heaven. Soul winning is very costly. Bible knowledge is very hard won. Prayer is very difficult. So we are spending our money and our spiritual resources on what we can't take with us. How foolish. Why expend your life on what you can't take with you? That's how foolish greed is. How hopeless independence can be. Did you know we strive to be independent all of our life? Everybody wants financial independence and everything independence. Do you know how bad that ends up? Do you know how lonely independent people are? Do you know how much they miss in life? God made the church to be interdependent, to feel for one another, to care for one another, to laugh together, to cry together, to support one another, to bear one another's burdens. How can you participate in the body of Christ if your whole life is toward independence? God says, I don't want you independent, I want you dependent, I want you submissive to one another, and most of all, to me. A Psalm 92, life of intentional fruit-bearing, learns how restless discontentment can be, how empty pleasures become so quickly. Our culture is driven by discontent. I mean, who wants to have a car that looks like that when the new ones look like this? I mean, who wants to have, uh, you know... uh, a house looks like that when you have a house like this. Who wants to have a job like that when you have a job like this? It's just being discontent with what we have. And there's this restlessness that's not from God. God says, you should yield your life to me and use your energies not for what will matter for a little while, but for what matters forever. Don't let discontent and restlessness rob you. Number two, a life of spiritual maturity has learned how priceless real friends truly become. How endless Christ's joys can be. How numerous ministry opportunities are all around us. Did you know if we take our eyes off from this this endless discontented seeking for more stuff and look around us, there are countless ministries available. Countless. Going and visiting people... uh, used to be called shut-ins, those who can't get out, visiting those in the rest home, visiting those who are, who are uh, unable. I remember Howie Hendricks, when I was at Dallas Seminary, told us, he says, why don't for one year, instead of buying everybody too much stuff, he says, why don't you find a poor family and go buy presents and watch their joy as you give it to them? Well, that was a radical idea in seminary. It's the idea of not getting but giving is part of this intentional fruit-bearing lifestyle. Well, here are some attitudes that will steal our fruits. Here are attitudes that you can't find in verses 12, 13, 14, and 15, okay? 
Let me just apply this to the 21st century. Okay, here are some attitudes that steal fruit and rob us of rewards. The first attitude is the the attitude I call exceptionism. I think my life is an exception to God's word. Yes, that's good for Daniel, it's good for Paul, it's good for David. In fact, it's good for most of you, but not for me. You don't understand what I've gone through. You don't understand how I was raised. You don't understand what my parents did to me, or what my husband did to me, or what my wife did, or what, what my boss did to me. I'm an exception to the word of God or my emotional problems, or my physical problems, or my health. I'm an ex- the problem of exceptionism makes me think my life is an exception to God's word. Thus, I can excuse myself from doing anything for heaven because of my past, my pain, my poverty, my poor self-image. And did you know that exceptionism can erase Christ's well done from your life? If you say, I'm an exception to this, I have emotional limitations, physical limitations, abuse limitations, financial limitations, education limitations. You can erase God's well done if you are an exceptionistic person. God resists us when we maintain another bad attitude, an assumption of our own superiority. That's the opposite. The exceptionist thinks they've had too many bad things happen, they can't do anything. There's another problem, this attitude of superiority. This attitude that we consistently think we are more right than anyone else. You ever met someone like that? They're right on everything. Kind of, we call them what? A know-it-all, you know? They just, they just have this assumption of their own superiority and they constantly think they're more right than anyone else and God will not tolerate a habit we maintain of building up ourselves by tearing down others. The way that we grow fruitful in the courts of God is not stepping on top of everybody else. There's this wondrous humility that comes of being fellow heirs and fellow citizens and fellow servants of God. Here's another attitude that God won't tolerate. The third one is our impulse to promote ourselves. God has to chasten us when we constantly are promoting ourselves. Just as he has to resist our tendency to take credit for things that were really the ideas or the work of others. We have this self-promotionism that's just part of America as part of the fall, as part of sin and the flesh. You ever meet people that are just always promoting themselves? I mean, you're talking about this and they go, oh, I've done that! Can't you just feel it? They can't. And that's something we have to pray for in the power of the Spirit. And that's why we lovingly minister to one another and point out exceptionism, superiority, constant self-promotion. That grieves the Spirit of God. Here's another attitude. The Holy Spirit is grieved and our fruit-bearing ceases when we hold a grudge over the slights that we've been guilty of committing ourselves and we see it in someone else and we hold a grudge against them. We are so prone to to let someone hurt us and we hold a grudge against them and yet we do the very same things. And that's a complete denial of Ephesians 4.32 to be kind and tender heart and forgiving just like God has forgiven so much that we have done and sinned in our own life. Here's another one. God will always stand against our uncanny ability to rationalize. We justify and excuse what we do while at the same time or even over the same issues being unsympathetic and judgmental with others. We rationalize us doing it. We say, well, you know, I'm, I need that. But they shouldn't do it. And we, we totally are against the sins that so often easily beset us. And we rationalize and justify them in our life. And say, oh, I, I, I'm under so much pressure, I have to eat. Or I'm under so much pressure, you know, that I have to decline in my time with the family and all that. But you, you know, and, and we just, we justify and rationalize. Here's another one. God is at war against all the unmortified pockets of pride in our life. What do pockets of pride look like? That's when I'm proud of my intellect or I'm proud of my achievements or I'm proud of my giftedness or I'm proud of my goodness. Pockets of pride in my life will erase Christ well done. Do you always think of Lot? I think of Lot. The Bible says Lot was a righteous man. But Lot thought he could stand living in the midst of the most gross sinfulness and he couldn't. And Lot lost his wife 
He lost his children. He lost his name, his reputation. He was saved, yet so as by fire because he had unmortified pockets of pride. It started out when he was a young man and he picked the best for himself. His uncle Abraham said, what part of the land do you want? And he looked around and he said, that's the best and I'm going to only have the best for Lot. That pride was never mortified and ended up making his family, his children, God's enemies. God says, I'll resist exceptionism, superiority, self-promotion, holding a grudge, rationalizing and justifying, unmortified pockets of pride. No, no. If I'm controlling your life, then you will surrender to me your time and you will seek me first. There's the first test. If God's in control of your life, you will have time to meet with him. You will surrender to him your attitude. You will not say that's just the way I am. You'll say, take my attitude and bear the fruit of your spirit in my life. You'll surrender to him your body. You will not say, that's just the way I was born. That's the way I am. No, you'll say, Lord, crucify me. Take control of these hands, these feet, this mind, my body. And you'll say what we just sang. I love that chorus. All I have belongs to you. For all I have has come from you. Nothing I own, nothing I possess. All of it's by your own hand. It's by your righteousness. So please take this offering of all I am to you today and use it for your glory. Who controls your life? You or the Lord? How can you tell? By your attitude, by your actions, by your time, by what you do with your treasures. Let's bow before the Lord and say again to him, you can have all of me. Father, I thank you we have all of you. We got you. That marvelous, miraculous moment, that instant of salvation when you came to live within us and you give not your spirit by measure. We have the measureless, boundless, all of you, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily within us through you, O Christ, and by your spirit, dear Father. But you do not yet have all of us. And I pray that we would say, Lord, We want you to have all of us. May the words of that song ring in our hearts. All I have belongs to you because it all came from you. Nothing I own, nothing I'm going to grasp and possess. It's just you and your faithfulness that have given it to me. I pray that we would renew our consecration to you, that we would relinquish the control of all of our lives to you, And then say, Lord, how do you want me to live the rest of this day? What do you want me to do with your hands, your time, your body, your treasures, your attitude? We pray that you will cause us to increase and abound in holiness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 